All right, what's the scene about? Uh, we got a guy, and I'm typing all of this. There's a guy, he's looking through the window at this woman, and we're wondering, you know, and then if I have an idea that I like, in all caps, it'll be like, ah, we find out he's sitting in the, you know, we've, you know, something that's, that's worth, worth keeping. And then I'll end up with, I don't know, 300 pages of that, and I'll print it out and go through and in highlighter sort of uh, mark the things that are worth keeping. And then I'll take another file and dump it all down into, okay, here are all these random sentences in capital letters that might be good. From that, it kind of turns into note cards, like literal note cards. And, uh, and I lay them out on my floor and kind of the three acts of a movie structure. And that's sort of my process. But I find if I'm not tethered to something, if I'm not physically writing something down, if I just lay on the couch and think, I'm either asleep or I'm suddenly thinking about what groceries I need to pick up or if I took the trash out or my mind just wanders. This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. On this show, I explore the intersection of passion and profit so you can achieve success by your own definition. Our guest today wanted to be a screenwriter, so he decided that it was his job. He sat at his desk from 9 to 5 every day, writing frantically, and each night he went to another job, one that paid him. He waited tables. After three years, he sold his first screenplay. Then he sold some others here and there, and then the phone stopped ringing. So after one failed script, he was contractually obligated to write another one. And that script became The Blacklist. It's a thriller on NBC starring James Spader. They're starting their fifth season this week. You must have many questions. So let's begin with the most important one, why I'm here. One man, his name is Ronco Zamani. You want him, I want him. So let's say our interests are aligned. From this point forward, there's one very important rule. I speak only with Elizabeth Keene. Who the hell's Elizabeth Keene? Spader plays Reddington, who is a highly experienced private jet-setting criminal who acts as an informant to the FBI and who has a puzzling interest in Agent Elizabeth Keene, played by Megan Boone. In this conversation, we're going to learn what was the mindset that John put himself in to make it through the three-year project of writing his first screenplay. How does John ward off his distractibility and channel it into his writing method? I think this is a great lesson in how in creative work, the final product is totally different from the process that's actually used to get there. And how was John's writing process changed by being joined by a writing team and then basically having to make an entire movie a week? By the way, John's a Nebraska native like me. Hopefully you won't mind listening to us reminisce a little bit about that strange place in the beginning of our conversation. If not, go ahead and skip ahead and you'll hear some really great stuff on doing tough and long creative projects. And I want to try a little something different. I want to recommend a product to you. If you buy it through the URL I share, you'll be supporting the show. The product that I'm recommending is a laptop stand. You can check it out at cadavy.net slash stands. So I was once interviewing a doctor for an article that I was writing on ergonomic computing. And he had this great quote. He said, a laptop by definition is a disaster. And I know laptops are great, but what he means is that when you're working on a laptop, your hands are in one place and then your head is pointed not too far above where your hands are. So that means that either the screen is in the right place or your hands are in the right place, but usually neither. Usually you're hunched over with your neck craned down at your screen and your elbows are splayed out. So to have an ergonomic setup, the top of your screen the top of your screen should be about level with your eyes. Then your hands should be much lower. If you let your arms hang down at your sides, then you bend your arms to about 90 degrees. That's about where your keyboard should be. And that's not possible with a laptop. That's why I use this amazing laptop stand. It makes sure that my screen is at the proper height. And it's super lightweight. It travels well. It collapses down to a smaller size than an umbrella. You can pack it in your bag. You can take it to the cafe or a co-working space. You can just set it up in your office. Go ahead and check it out. It can transform your workspace from a disaster to a dream for less than what you charge for an hour of your time. Again, you'll be supporting the show if you buy at cadavy.net slash stand. That's cadavy.net slash stand. I'm trying to get a little more improvisational with my intros. So I'm going to probably ramble for a couple minutes here. If you are really not into that, you don't want to hear what I have to say. You might want to go ahead and skip ahead here to get to the main content. 
I know that there are some podcasters that I've listened to who will have kind of rambly intros and sometimes you feel like you want them to get out of the way. But then there's other podcasters that I listen to who they have really smart things to say in their intros. And I end up listening to their episodes, even if I'm not interested in the guest, just because it's sort of like a free prize inside. I get to hear what they have to say. So it's something that I'm trying. A little bit of it is that I'm not a particularly off the cuff person. I script out my intros. You might be able to tell, but it's something that I want to practice. You know, I've gotten better with my vocal delivery and everything as I've gone on. There's something useful here, I promise. It's not just all about me here, but this is something that you can use in a lot of things that you're doing. If there is some skill that you want to build, then you can kind of work with it and improvise with it a little bit. You know, one thing that I'm doing before I record my intros is now I'll listen to a little bit of a show called Sleep With Me by Drew Ackerman, who I met at Podcast Movement. And that show, its entire premise is that it's so boring that it causes you to fall asleep. Now, that's not what I'm going for, but I do appreciate that he's very stream of consciousness, which I think that's something that I often have like a cognitive block with is it's difficult for me to string words together without pausing here and there. So I will listen to that a little bit. And then before I record, I will just improvise into the microphone and do some stream of consciousness. You can feel very fortunate that that's not what I'm publishing. I'm not publishing that to you, but it's something that I do to build that skill. It's very easy to decide, oh, I'm just not this way, or I just don't have this skill or that skill. But there are ways to do little tests. And especially when it's something that you're repeating over time, like I'm doing with this podcast, you get better and better. I mean, you can listen to this podcast, you can listen to the first intros or even the first interviews. And then the latest ones, you're going to hear a difference in you know how comfortable do I sound? Am I listening to the guests well and asking the questions that need to be asked in the moment? Like that stuff changes over time. And anything that you feel like you don't have a great skill in, that's not necessarily you're not sentenced to having that skill. Anyway, hopefully that's a, a bit of a ramble that might be of some use to you. But no in the future they might be a little bit longer intros than usual. You might have noticed last week's was very long. If you weren't in that, I'm sorry. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. I can't guarantee that it's going to change the way that I do things. I kind of got inspired by Mark Marin because I feel a little bit like the Mark Marin of entrepreneurship, which sounds like a brag, but really like Mark Marin, when he started WTF, was like the loser of comedy, right? He had been doing it for so long. He had never really gotten that good at it, but he still had a lot of connections. And so he started having these interviews and he was very open about the process the entire way. And things went very well for him. And that's not to say that I expect the same thing to happen, but I did go back and listen to his intros that are, you could call them rambly, but he usually had pretty good stories prepared for them. And they were really good, which I thought was funny because I had previously been so annoyed by his long intros because whenever I was listening to him, I was like, get out of the way. I want to listen to Louis C.K. or want to listen to David Foley or I want to listen to Ryan Adams or whomever. And so it just got me thinking that it's something worth trying. Now let's read a little bit of listener mail as we approach half a million downloads. And we're really, really close to half a million downloads. Uh, I did a little bit of musing on an earlier episode about the Spotify streams that I recently discovered. And I was asking myself, are these streams real? Because it was like 20% more downloads on top of my regular downloads. So I got some confirmation that those downloads are real. Sarah wrote me and she says, I just listened to your last LYW episode. Glad you found us Spotify followers. Yes, we're legit streams. We count too. I just found you a few weeks ago through the Spotify dash and I'm really liking your insights and the conversations you have with your guests. Okay. Okay, Sarah, you're real. And yes, you definitely count. And there was one other person who tweeted at me something similar. So that's at least two of you who came through Spotify. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarah, for writing. You, whoever you are, I love getting your notes and feedback. Or, hey, maybe you can have a question I could answer on the show or something. Write a review at cadavy.net slash review. Tweet at me at at Cadavy or email me at david at cadavy.net. Here's John Bokenkamp. I'm here with John Bokenkamp, creator of uh, NBC's The Blacklist. I guess let's start with uh, your version of the story of how it was that we met, John. 
Wow. Well, I had, I was living in Los Angeles and moving to Nebraska and I wanted to make some party invites to a going away party and was looking for stuff online. And I found, you're going to have to help me remember specifically what they were, but sure. a great series of sort of quotes that were like joke, like quotes that were kind of a dig on Nebraska, but maybe not that, that, that I was like, Oh my God, these are great. Can we, and I wanted to use them as these invites. Do you remember even one of them? Like, yeah, absolutely. Um, they were postcards. They were Nebraska postcards there you go. to be specific. And they were from a competition, like an American Institute of Graphic Arts competition that I had entered. And, and so one of them would be like the Loma Prieta earthquake, um, which happened in 1989 in San Francisco. And it would, you know, talk about all the damage that it caused, et cetera. And then it would say it didn't happen in Nebraska. Right. It was like, it was like all these, all these sort of things that happen in the world, but they didn't happen in Nebraska. And they were all bad things, I think, if I remember right. So it was about gun violence and different things. And it, it was all the joke, I guess, was all that nothing happens there. So anyway, I was looking for probably just weird postcards like Nebraska at night, you know, just the black postcard or, you know, weird pictures of giant ears of corn on the back of a flatbed trailer, sort of kitschy stuff and found those and reached out to you. And, uh, you know, was asking, can I use these for my going away party? And, 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 uh, you were generous enough to let me, uh, to send me some files and do it. They were great. Yeah. I got to get those printed back up. I got to get some of those. I, you I, I have them. I have, I'm sure I have the PDF sitting somewhere on my laptop and they're, you know, they're probably in, in my Gmail as well from We're sending gonna them have to, to you. Yeah, we'll, we'll have, have to, to find those. Them. But Maybe that was 10 years ago. Those. That's a very astute, astute observation, by the way, that you got the joke, I guess. Um, yeah, I love the irony of it. It was just, it was just, it was just a, a, a sort of odd, fun dig. And, you know, I, I got back home. I moved, I was back in Nebraska recently and my wife, had, either my wife got or somebody gave to us a shirt that said, uh, you know, friends don't let friends move to Nebraska, you know? And so anyway, that's my, my badge of honor is being from there and, and living there. And, uh, I, it's, it's a strange, uh, place that I happen to love. So, uh, that's the connection. And then you reached out, I think via Twitter that we reconnected, what, 10 years later, which is, is bananas. Yeah. So it's awesome that we're, we're talking right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you're from Nebraska and you're from Kearney, Nebraska, right? To be mm -hmm. specific. Now, for people who don't know, that's the middle of Nebraska. I always talk about on my show that I'm from Nebraska. I mention it passing. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, so I'm a city slicker. Yeah, that doesn't really concerned. count. Yeah, that, as far as I'm concerned, that's full-on city slicker. That's, that's what I got. And, you know, I went to school in Kearney for a year and a half. Uh-huh. There you go. So. As did I, about two years. And so I got the same sort of thing. You know, that was actually my first encounter with... Uh, culture shock. Oh, by going, by going to Kearney and feeling like, where did the city go? By driving two and a half hours and being told that I'm a city slicker and being uh -oh. surrounded by guys who are like, chew, everybody's chewing tobacco, everybody's listening to country music, uh, they're, they're hunting raccoons uh, for right. entertainment. <laughs> Right. Uh, are these all things? And how about this? Is this a thing? One of the I things think none of those, by the way. But uh, okay. yeah. But anyway, you were saying. Well, what about this? Uh, if you w if you went to a party, I think you you went to I think it was called Kearney State College for a couple semesters yourself. Mm -hmm. and I did. You, yeah, yeah. It was actually when I went there, it was called. Uh, it became part of the university system. Became uh, U uh, the University of Nebraska at Kearney or. UNK, which there's all kinds of fun, you know, you can't That's spell right. drunk without UNK. You can't spell flunk without UNK. There's all kinds of these sort of UNK things, but I went to UNK for two years. Yeah. That's what it was called when I went Pretty as well. Cool. Yeah. So, um, and did you ever encounter if somebody might, they called Budweiser, Bud Heavy. I didn't know. I didn't know that. And, and so if you wanted to make friends, you would go to a party and you could, you could have a 12 pack of Budweiser with you and you could offer people, Oh, would you like, would you like a beer? And these, these big strapping farm good old boys are like, Oh no, man, I can't drink Bud heavy. This stuff makes me throw up. Oh really? Wow. You never encountered that. Okay. Maybe that was, I just... no, look, I was maybe a little bit of a, uh, social, uh, outcast. I don't know. I, I wasn't real. I wasn't, I mean, it, maybe it was, a, I had a different experience because I went to this school where 
I moved into the dorm for the first semester to sort of get the taste of college and was like, what am I doing? This is ridiculous. And moved back home. So I was going to, it was like going to a different high school for me because it was in the town where I grew up and lived and there was none of the culture shock. I had the culture shock when I went to Omaha and, and you know, realized you could sit outside at a cafe or, or buy a croissant. That to mm. me was culture shock or, or one way streets. Like what's so, a croissant type of thing? Yeah. What's a croissant? This, this croissant has chocolate. My God, it's in French. I don't know how to say this. So, uh, the, the, uh, so I, I just, you know, it just, it was, it was home. You know, when I went to school there, it was just home. In fact, a lot of the kids I went to high school went there. And so, uh, it, so I, I think there's a very different experience of other people who go to school there and, um, and are outside of the community, you know, that are the sort of, uh, city folk, as we would say, or, or other people from very, very small farm towns that come in. I'm sure it's a very different experience that way. Oh, I I remember uh, having uh, friends that they had graduating classes of nine and, and, you know, Carney was a big Mm -hmm. uh, metropolis to them. Right. So that's about right. Yeah. So so when you decided that you were going to move transfer from UNK and you decided you were going to go to USC and study film, uh, yeah. did everybody think you were crazy? Um, I think they thought I was crazy before probably because I had always, uh, you know, I always wanted to go to Los Angeles and make movies. And, you know, I wanted to be Luke Skywalker when I was a kid that I wanted to be like, wanted to be an actor. And, um, and so I, uh, I would go, I, I, we made movies, you know, we'd go around and do these sort of, uh, make these little independent type films or, uh, you know, VHS movies and so forth. And, um, and so I was always, you know, bugging people at the mall, uh, interviewing them or making little documentaries or whatever it was. I was always sort of making movies of some sort, uh, and that, and, and always knew that that's what I kind of wanted to do. So, um, when I went to, U, to to USC, that was sort of a. I think everyone's like, "Thank God he's leaving. He can go do that and go go be part of the movie world and all the the weirdos in Hollywood." But everyone was super supportive in the process of it. You know, we'd they would very politely ask us to leave the mall and stop filming, or they would say, "Yeah, you can shoot your you know your little movie here in the gas station." And we just show up with cameras and and sort of go in and do that. You know, a bunch of high school kids or even in college, we did that and. Um, that's not the case here. I don't think, I think in LA it's very, I, I would imagine, I would imagine growing up here, everyone's making a movie and every kid's going to be Luke Skywalker. And there's nothing, there's nothing unique about that. And, um, you know, to me, it was a very unusual, you know, it was a very, uh, sort of different, uh, it made me different. So, um, maybe that's part of what I dug about it. Were you scared to leave? No, no. Uh, not really. I mean, I was um, excited to leave. I, I, in fact, I couldn't wait to get. That's what's sort of ironic about it is that I couldn't wait to leave, and um, and was sort of sensible enough to be like, well, I'm going to take my math classes and science and all of these things at the local college because I could could not uh, conceive of, of spending money uh, or probably even get in to go for four years of school at USC. So I did all the all the, the real college classes in Nebraska and then transferred out to go to USC just to do all the film stuff. So I, I was, I was, I was like ready to, to bolt out of town, which eventually later, as I got older, uh, I, I love the place and I, my family and I moved back, but, um, yeah, I was definitely, I was definitely, uh, ready to roll. Was that a culture shock experience for you moving to California? Uh, yeah, it, it was. Um, I, but, but I loved it. I mean, you know, USC, at least I think when I was there, had had more people that attended college there than are in my hometown. You know, I think Kearney had like 25,000 people and USC had 30 or something like that. So the, the campus had the entire more more people on campus than the entire community itself. Um, but I but uh, again, I, I thought it was I thought it was great. I was um, I don't know, maybe idealistic about it and, and excited and, and just, yeah, it it was culture shock, but in a really, in a really marvelous way. What surprised you about it? Um, how talented the other people I was going to school with were. Uh, I think that was the thing that I, I, uh, found the most. I mean, some of the stuff they taught us in film school was sort of here's what a tripod is, you know, here's how you edit film, which doesn't even exist anymore. It was, it was almost like a trade school in that way. But, um, 
But the people that I went to school with, uh, I was like, wow. You know, I was, I was the big fish in the small pond making my little movies and having premieres at churches and, and high school gymnasiums and stuff. And I, I thought that was pretty cool. We would borrow the limousine of the one person in town who drove, and it wasn't even really a full limousine. Like they had this little limo, and he would drive around the block and pick everyone up and drop them off so we could all walk in to our movie premiere, you know, the eight of us who were in the movie, and it's the same car that kept going around the block. And to me, that I, I thought we were pretty cool. So when I got out to USC and um, and met people who had made incredible films and had done far more than I had. And just in, in watching them work and, um, you know, it, it was, it, that was fascinating to me. That was like a, it was a real eye opener. Um, just of, of what, I don't know. I, it sounds silly to say, but what, of, of what talent is out there and, and, and just, you know, also being surrounded by other people who were like-minded, you know, that were really hungry to go make a movie or were movie fans or wanted to go see movies. You know, I was just, I really felt sort of steeped in that in a way that was both a little intimidating, but also sort of welcoming. Yeah. I was wondering about that. Was there any sense of like, wow, I really have to step up my game? Um, yeah, there was. And, and I think also sort of figuring out what my game was, you know, like, okay, well I'm, you know, it's funny. I think back on it, I, I sort of forget this, but I was, at least in high school and sort of the beginning of college, I, I was all, all about like Coca-Cola and dust and the road and the road trip and this sort of all American cliche thing, you know, Elvis music and CCR. And, and, um, I don't know why, but it was a very apple pie baseball kind of, um, that's what I thought I was in that group of everyone that I sort of met. And I, I sort of, uh, you know, em, embraced that and then, uh, you know, maybe figured out that wasn't exactly who I was or wanted to find other pieces of myself that were interesting. And, you know, you, you try to find a voice and stand out and be different. And, you know, some people are really funny and doing these comedy movies. And I'm like, oh, I'm not funny. What am I going to do? Or, you know, you, you find a movie that you really connect with and you try to, I, at least I, you know, sort of associate that with, with who I am and I want to make something like that. And so, that's probably anybody going through college, you know, trying to find yourself. But but it definitely was put in sharp focus by being surrounded by a bunch of other people who who were just as hungry and, and excited about it as I was. Yeah. And so The Blacklist, I would say, is a thriller genre it, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, James Spader starring. Um, what got you interested in the thriller genre? Um. You know, I think at that time, I you know, college and and a little bit uh, after that, but I, I just love those movies. I, I loved. Um, I'm trying to think of what you know, Presumed Innocent was a movie I loved, or um, you know, all the. I, I'm a huge fan of like all these Alan Pakula movies, whether they're you know, Clute or uh, All the President's Men or Three Days of the Condor. I, I dug those. I always liked. Um, Alfred Hitchcock. I liked Edgar Allan Poe. I, I liked the, the weird macabre sort of, uh, you know, when we're reading stories in literature classes or in high school, I always kind of dug those things that were murder mysteries, you know? And, um, I was just fascinated by that. My mom worked at a, at a, a basically a juvie hall, uh, it's a youth development, uh, center for boys, you know, troubled kids. When, when you city kids in Omaha are troubled and, I, you know, I steal a car. people getting sent to Carney, yeah. Yeah, you get sent, you get sent to this, this sort of, uh, you know, you, if, you, if you call in a bomb threat and you're, you know, 14, they don't send you to, you know, uh, San Quentin. They send you to Carney and you go there and you stay there for a while. And my mom would work there and she had a pager and every once in a while they would have, you know, you get a page that they had an escapee and, I was always like, and she'd have to leave and everyone in the school would go out looking and the police were looking for some kid. Yeah, always, very odd to me. And I was, I sort I remember thinking, you know, you wouldn't catch me. You know, I would, uh, I'd, I'd double back and I'd have a car and I'd go hang out at the hospital lobby. And I, you know, I had it all figured out. I don't know why, but that sort of, th that sort of gamesmanship, you know, is super fascinating to me. And, and I found that that works well in thrillers, those kinds of stories that are, mathematical and, um, you know, sort of emotional in an eerie way. I'm just fascinated by that stuff. So I, you know, I love those movies. My mom had a weird job and, um, I think I was trying to figure out who I was and that, that sort of clicked. And when did you start writing? 
Um, uh, you know, I was, I mean, I was writing as a kid, you know, I, we were doing skits, friends of, uh, of mine would do, you know, get the video camera out and do a Rocky movie, you know, and I, I, I write a three page story and it was basically the exact same thing that happened in Rocky, you know, it was like a bad, a bad ripoff of, uh, of Rocky, or we'd go out and make a cowboy movie in high school, you know, or I wrote a play with a friend when I was in high school. So I was always kind of writing just by virtue of the fact that I had to, that I, if I wanted to go make a movie, there was no script to make. So I'd have to go write something. And I, I was a terrible, you know, uh, I remind my kids, I was a terrible writer. The grades I got, I, I can't spell. I still can't spell. It's, you know, sentence structure and, and, and all of that. I'm not good at. And, and so it, it was um, not something I was, uh, na- I probably am still not naturally good at. It, it, uh, but it was something that had to happen. And, and then in, it really, in, at the end of college, I, I, I sort of somehow got in my head the idea that I wanted to direct and Nobody was going to, you know, give me some script and say, hey, you're one of many college kids that wants to direct. Congratulations. Here's a movie. And I thought, well, you know, the only way I'm going to get to direct a movie is if I write something that is so good that the only way, uh, the, you know, the studios can have it is if, if uh, they let me direct it. And, and I got that in my head. And so I started writing, you know, in college. I it really I wrote my first screenplay probably took like it legitimately took three years. And, um, and, and so I was writing in college and I got my first job out of college was a rewrite on a, on a Billy Friedkin movie. And, and that's when I started, you know, being blown away by the fact that anybody would pay me to write anything, but, um, but started to sort of pay to write for the screen. Yeah, it was, I, um, I was hired by a a friend. I made a documentary out of film school uh, in the, in the genre of the Coca-Cola road and the dust. I made a documentary called after sunset, which was about the, the death of the drive in movie theater. And, um, in doing that, I met a guy named Don Sanders. He's a a great friend. And he, he hired me to sort of ghost write a a coffee table book on drive in movies. And that was my first job. I was waiting tables and, you know, my, my thought was I'm, I'm a writer by day and I wait tables at night. So I would write screenplays all day or a screenplay for three years all day and then wait tables at night to pay the rent. And, and Don paid me to hire, to, to, uh, to quit my job and to write this coffee table book for him. And I did, and that was great. That was really my first paid gig. And then out after that, I did, I, I went out and pitched and I got a rewrite. My first real studio job was a rewrite on, um, a Billy Friedkin movie, uh, that was never made. Um, that, uh, you know, it was a rewrite and I was, you know, it was, I guess, 97 probably. And, um, it was great. It was super, I'm sure it was terrible. And then they won, they regretted that they had hired me the minute they had hired me, but it was fascinating. I find it interesting that you were able to sustain a three year, uh, screenwriting project as your first, uh, screenplay do you have any insight into how you were able to uh, keep going for that long? Well, I was doing other things that, you know, I was, uh, I have no idea what I was doing. I was working on this movie that I had made the, the drive-in movie. And, and it was just, I was working on that. And I'm sure I had other ideas. I have no idea, uh, David. I mean, I, I wanted to make the movie and I thought the script wasn't ready. And I did make the movie by, and, and, and the, it was called Bad Seed. Preston Tilk was the name of the script. And, and uh, they, ultimately it was called Bad Seed, which I have no idea why they called it Bad Seed. It makes no sense. There's no Bad Seed in the you, movie. You sold it to a I so, Yeah. The, 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 yes, it was, it was sold and it's uh, probably out there somewhere. But, but it, was, um, it was just a story I loved. And it started off as a short film that I made in school a bad knockoff of some Edgar Allan Poe sort of type story. Uh, Hitchcock meets Edgar Allan Poe. And I worked on it. And and I, I didn't know how, part of it is probably I just didn't know how to write a script. And, and I'd never written, I'd never read one of these books of, you know, Robert McGee story writing. I guess I had been in film school, but even there we wrote scenes and stuff. But I, I you know, I didn't know what I was doing is probably why it took so damn long, you know. Um, and well, I love, I'm, I'm, what I'm curious about though is that you were able to kind of hold the vision in your brain to, to not say, ah, yeah, I just can't go any further on this project. And, and that you were I, able to, I don't to think that was ever, I don't it. think that was ever an, an, an option. I feel like I, I really wanted to direct it and I, 
and I didn't know what else to do. And I really loved it, you know, and, um, and sort of, I, I think part of it was surprising myself along the way. I still feel like that's something that's really important to me. Like if I'm working on a scene and I just can't figure it out and it's, and I just slogging away at it, I, I know something's wrong with it, but the stuff that's really easy to write when I start, when I'm kind of smiling to myself or it makes me laugh or it's, it's sort of, I feel like it's a good turn. I love that. And I, and I think I was sort of figuring that out was probably part of the, the three year process where I was, um, uh, you know, and by the way, it's not like I was waking up at six in the morning and, uh, working until eight at night when I had to go to work at the old spaghetti factory. I'm sure I was probably waking up at 10 and there was probably a trip to the post office or two and, uh, some grocery shopping or whatever, but, but it was, that was my job. And, uh, you know, and, and I, felt like it was my job. And I was, I was cutting the movie at the same, that, that movie after sunset at the same time. But I just, I really loved the story and I wanted to make that movie. And I knew that, um, that was my, that was my ticket, you know? And I sent it to, I sent it to every film festival I could. I sent it out to, uh, or not film festival, but screenwriting competitions and, and every studio I could. And I got an agent off of that script. And so there was traction that, that I felt like I was starting to get, you know, an agent would read it and say, well, great, let's, let's work together, but, uh, you need to make some changes here. And then the movie, you know, we found money for the movie and they're like, okay, well we like this, but we need to change that. So there was a, an evolution to it. Like there is with any project, you know, but, um, but I, I think at the end of the day, I just really loved the story. And I, I felt like I was trying to find my voice as a writer and figure out how to tell the story. Do you have any insight or do you recall what your self-talk was during that time? Or, you know, what did this mean to your existence, this this first screenplay? How do you mean self-talk? Just like what I was saying to myself, yeah, what, what I was saying? What you say to yourself to actually get, was it easy to sit down and, and, and no. write? It sounds like you were poking around to look for the things that were going to motivate you and make it easier for you. You know, the things that make you smile while you're writing about it and stuff. But, you know, what would you tell yourself um, did you have moments where you were saying like, oh, I've been doing this for a year and a half. It's just not <laughs> happening or, you know, what was, I never, what was thought, going on I never there? thought that, you know, one of the things that was happening at that time is I was living with a good friend, uh, uh, this guy, his name's Kurt Kenny. My wife and I, uh, were, we were, the three of us were living in this little apartment together. And, and, um, even before Kathy had moved in, my, my wife, uh, had eventually, you know, became my wife. We, I was living there and I would wake up. And I remember hearing Kurt in the other room typing and I'm like, fuck, he's up. God, what time is it? He's working already. And, and he, and he still is just a very dedicated, Kurt's direct. In fact, right now he's directing an episode of the blacklist, the second one he's directed. And, and, you know, being with somebody again, that's what I mean by meeting people in film school and surrounding myself with other, not intentionally, but being surrounded with people who are very uh, talented and driven, um, made me feel like I had to work harder, you know? And, um, and I remember at that time that, you know, my roommate and I both were sort of in the minority of people who there was like a, a, a path that felt like you had to take. You could either go get a job at a studio and, uh, try to work up that pathway and be an assistant and answer phones and, or what I did, we did, what I did was say, well, I'm, going to work at the old spaghetti factory at night and park cars as a valet parking attendant and make money that way. But during the day, I'm a writer and nobody's paying me, but I'm a writer. And I somehow it's ridiculous to great pride in that. I, I, I was, I was really proud of the fact that I, I went to film school and I had these huge college debts, but I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm a writer and that's what I do. And that's what I'm going to do every day. And I, I made this movie and I wrote a script and I got a rewrite job and you know, Oddly enough, some of the other people that I, uh, who took that agent, uh, you know, assistant path turned out to be incredibly successful and that worked for them as well. But, but for me, I guess I just took pride in the fact that I, I, I was just happy to be doing it. You know, I was living in LA, I was able to pay my rent and I didn't have a family or really any obligations and it was, uh, it was fun. Again, all that said in hindsight, I'm sure if you zipped back and sat with me there for a day of riding, it was torture. Like it kind of often is, you know, I find it interesting that you put yourself in that mindset and, and 
kind of said to yourself, this is my job. I'm a writer. I might not be getting paid for it, but this is my job. Is that accurate? Yeah, it is. And I still feel that way. And, and that's one of the things that right now with the show really makes me sort of fearless. Like I, I know that, um, it does, if it all uh, sort of goes away tomorrow, I'm, I still get to go write and I still get to go come up with stuff. And, wh- you know, because I've had like many writers, probably most incredible ups and incredible downs. And there's a lot of downs and um, times when I can't get hired, times when nobody will answer the phone. And I don't know what to do during those times other than just write something else, you know? I mean, it's what I like to do. And it's at times it can be paralyzing just in the real world in terms of how am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to pay the mortgage? What, you know, do I need to get a real job? But I don't, I just can't, I, I never have really imagined myself with a real job. Like that, that idea just absolutely terrifies me, you know? And, and, and I've had some of those working at a camera shop or as an editor, different things like that, where I need to show up and punch a clock. And that just makes me tired. I I, I can't do that. So, um, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not giving you a very good answer, but it's, it's, uh, I think it's interesting. I think that the people who, who you, you talked about who, some of them who did go through the career path route and then turned out fine, you know, maybe that worked out for their personality, but I think it's interesting that you decided I'm going to do this it sounds like I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to find my voice. I'm going to find my way of doing things. And I'm going to treat it like a job. I, I can only imagine that that built some skills and resilience in you um, that made it possible so that when you did have those downs, uh, that you didn't panic and flounder and, well, that, and that, run, that make is a true. compromise. It, it, it's true in that I remember at that time, and I still feel this way, it was not like, I've never been the guy who's like, you know what, I'm going to go to Norm's on La Cienega and kind of hang out there tonight from noon to three in the morning, kind of see when the, when the vibes hit me and see if I can have an idea. Like, I, I've never been that guy. I, I, uh, maybe it's just a personality type, but by saying that this is my job and knowing that I got to go sling spaghetti at seven o'clock, I, I knew that I, I was always very rigid about my schedule. So you know, if I, I'm like up and go try to work out and go do my, you know, and then be at the desk by a certain time and take a half hour lunch and go get a sandwich, but then come back and work until a certain time, even if I'm not coming up with anything and everything is sort of, uh, it might not be ultimately super productive or stuff that I'm going to keep. I, I feel like I really try to keep bankers hours in that way that it's like, okay, if it's, if it's nine o'clock and I'm not sitting at my desk and like going, that's kind of embarrassing, you know, like I just, so I've, I've always sort of had that mentality. So there is a little bit of a rhythm to it or a, uh, dedication in terms of, you can't kind of go off and look into the heart of a rose and wait for inspiration. You just got to sit down and do it. I think you've probably heard the quote from at least a couple different sources. Inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us get up and go to work. I, well, I haven't heard that, but I think that, yeah. Absolutely right. There's no time to wait Chuck for inspiration. Close and Stephen King both said pretty much the same thing. Is that so, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what was your schedule? You you were you were starting writing at nine, basically. Yeah, I I get up, I go work. I by, by nine, I'm at the at the at my computer and and just and was literally. Was it the first thing you were doing in the in the morning, or? No, I get up. I I go. I. Uh, used to work out in the evenings. I try to do it in the mornings now, but I, I get up, I, I get something to eat and take a shower and get my shoes on. And my mother-in-law is laugh. She's like, well, you always have to have your shoes on. And I'm like, I know, I feel like I, if I have to run from somebody or if I have to do something, I want to have my, I want to be ready. And so <laughs> I, you know, I'm like, a thriller writer. I know what if I have, maybe I'm on the run. Maybe I got to go into a payphone booth and like call somebody and say, I didn't do this, you know, and I got to be able to move. And so I, I, so I, yeah, get up at the desk, dressed and ready to go nine o'clock. I'll work till noon, step out for a half hour, grab something to eat and then, and then and come back, you know, and it, again, this is all pre internet. There's no, there's no Twitter to check. There's no surfing. My, my distractions were basically to go to look at the refrigerator and stare at the same food and go, okay, there's nothing here or go down and see if the mail had come or, or go to the post office and mail something. Those are kind of the three good or were the three good distractions for me. But, um, 
But, uh, but yeah, it was a very rigid schedule. And then by the time five o'clock rolls around, I got to get to work and I put on the old uniform and roll in and work till, you know, one in the morning and come back and do it again. Wait, did you write from nine to five? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, when I say, right, I don't That's know a what long that writing session. <laughs> Is it? I, I, I mean, guess. I mean, I, from, do we do that now? I still do that. I was writing up until I, I quit at six yeah. today when we got on. So, uh, but yeah, I get it. Some, again, so I, I, I point that out because a lot of people do that. Some people are like, look, if I get two hours a day and that's great, or if I can do four hours, it's, I just, um, I, maybe I'm not, I, th- this sounds like false modesty, but I, I just don't, it takes that long for me to get anything good. You know, like I wish there's some people who could just sit down and it just comes out of them. I just, it, it, I got to go over it and over it and rethink it. And it's just a, that feels like the process. So were you sitting there moving your fingers the entire time? You know what I do? And, um, at one point I had to get one of these little bowler bracelets because my wrist started hurting. What I, what I, what I don't do as much anymore because there's a staff of writers and we talk is I, and, and, you know, a writer's room assistant who takes notes and stuff. But when I'm writing alone, even now I still do it. If I go off and I'm going to rewrite a draft or, or work on a scene on my own and I don't understand it, I'll open a scratch file. I call it a scratch file. And I just type to myself and I literally will type in everything that comes into my brain. And I, it's kind of a dialogue with myself where I say, all right, what's the scene about? Uh, we got a guy and I'm typing all of this. There's a guy, he's, he's looking through the window at this woman and we're wondering, you know, and I just, and then, and then if I have an idea that I like, I'll space down and hit caps and in all caps, it'll be like, ah, we find out he's sitting in the, you know, we've, you know, something that's, that's worth, worth keeping. And then I'll end up with, I don't know, 300 pages of that and I'll print it out and go through and, you know, in, in highlighter sort of, uh, mark the things that are worth keeping. You know, and then I'll take another file and dump it all down into, okay, here are all these random sentences in capital letters that might be good, you know, and from that, it kind of turns into note cards, like literal note cards. And, uh, and I lay them out on my floor and kind of the three acts of a movie structure. And that's sort of my process. But I find if I, if I am, if I'm not tethered to something, if I'm not physically writing something down, like if I, if I just lay on the couch and think I'm either asleep or I'm suddenly thinking about like what groceries I need to pick up or if I took the trash out or like my mind just wanders. I can't, I can't, um, be specific. So, so physically typing each letter sort of helps me, uh, go through and, and lock in and sort of be specific about what's going on. We're going to take a quick break. I'm thrilled to have Skillshare as a sponsor of Love Your Work. I know so many listeners out there are curious types like me. You never want to stop learning. That's why Skillshare is perfect for you. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 17,000 classes in design, business, and more. You can learn everything from business analytics to social media marketing to street photography. Like, let's say you want to be like our guest today. You want to be a wildly successful screenwriter like John Bokenkamp. You can take a screenwriting class from Sarah Zucker, who's a professional screenwriter. It's called Screenwriting the 10-Minute Short, and it will show you step-by-step how to write and produce a 10-minute film you can use as a calling card to try to get an agent, to get a contract, and you can even win an Oscar with a 10-minute short, apparently. With Skillshare, you get unlimited access to that screenwriting class and all the other classes for one low monthly price you never have to pay per class again. And Skillshare is giving my listeners here on Love Your Work a month of unlimited access absolutely free. Go to Skillshare.com slash Love Your Work to redeem your free month. Skillshare helps keep this podcast free. So please, if they interest you, show them the love. Go to Skillshare.com slash Love Your Work so they know that I sent you. Chris. Hey, Chris. I'm talking to you, Chris. Okay, so right now, most of you are like, who the heck is Chris? But there are a few of you who are really freaking out right now. So, Chris, I think now is the time for you to join Love Your Work Elite. You've been listening for a while. You like the show. You want to help keep it free for others. You also want early access to episodes. You want master classes. You want to hang out with me and all the other Chris's in the Love Your Work Elite community on our monthly office hours. 
our goal is to get 3% of our listeners and 100% of listeners named Chris to join Love Your Work Elite. That will help us keep making the show, keep making it free, and keep the back catalog free for everyone, too. I know you've been thinking about it, Chris, but now is the time. You're really just better off deciding and taking action right now. You'll have that mental space left over to think about something else. And you and all the other Chris's will just plain feel really good to be a bigger part of making this show. Maybe someday this can be a fully Chris-supported show. Go to lywelite.com and learn more and join. Again, you can join at lywelite.com even if your name isn't Chris. Okay, so you're basically free writing, writing to yourself. Uh, you print that stuff out, and then you start to find things, maybe highlight them, and then that turns into note cards. You can uh, yes. make a storyboard, and then from that, you can start developing dialogue and things like that. Yeah, the, the dialogue and all of that sort of is the very end of the process, but it's it's really about the story. Oh, to me, personally, it's about the story break. You know, it's about... There's usually something I'm super excited about, you know, whether it's a concept or it used to start with just an image. Like, like I say jokingly, but it's true. Like a guy, Robert Redford, there's a guy in a phone booth, his peacock coat collar is up and he says, I didn't do this. You know, it's that kind of image or some moment that I'm, and often in the episodes we do, it's about that. There's an image of, you know, a giant naked man going through the woods with a bow and arrow. What is that? Now, you're not going to see that on some other show. Let's do that. And so we'll come up with a story to try to fit that. That's just and, an image um, that pops into your brain and then you build off yeah, of that. Yeah, or something that maybe I've seen or something that seems odd or fun, you know, or weird. Or, or oftentimes they're, you know, references of some other movie or some other, something I've seen somewhere or somebody I know or, or some, you know, my... Uh, Anyway, so yes, they're, they're sort of random things that are, are little pieces of inspiration. And now with, with the stories, you know, there's usually more of a hook. There's more of a conceptual, okay, this is a story about cryogenics. This is a story about betrayal, you know, and trying to weave that around. But so to me, it's more about the, the break of the story and the reversals and trying to map your way through forward momentum in the story versus sort of great dial, you know, the dialogue and that stuff sort of last, I think. This practice of keeping your fingers moving was, how did you settle into that? I imagine there must have been at least building up to that, whether it was through high school or childhood or something, some points in time when you uh, messed around with different ways of doing it and then settled in on that. What was that process like? Yeah. I remember uh, writing longhand. Uh, on legal pads before I had a computer. Um, I, I think that uh, I probably stole that idea from my buddy, Kurt again, who every day is there working, but I, I don't, I don't know. Like I say, I was, a, I was not a good, I was the guy who, who was at the back of the classroom. They wouldn't let, I couldn't sit by the back of the classroom because if the fish tanks bubbling, the sound of the bubbles in the fish tank distract me and I can't, I can't focus, you know? So I, I was the guy who would go off and, meet with the, you know, the special ed teacher to, to, you know, work on reading and, and trying to figure out how, you know, to, to progress with language and that sort of stuff. And so it, it never, I was never good with the words, but to me, I, I feel like I see the pictures. And so, um, so that's maybe a way in which I do it. I, I don't know how that came about in terms of like when I just started sort of writing to myself, but, but, um, I know that if I just, I know this, if I just sit down and say, all right, let's write this scene. And I don't really know what it's about. Like I would be horrible in improv. That that's like the most terrifying thing you could ask me to do is get up on a stage and just improv. I, I would just freeze. So it, whether I'm pitching a movie or a, or a show, or I, I have it all written out. I know exactly what I'm going to say verbatim. I've rehearsed it over and over. And, and then I go in and I try to forget it and get through it. Um, but, but I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not, I have a hard time with sort of, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it, it's a process for me. And so it's, it's more of a, again, a repetition and a lot of time and, and, and just trying to, uh, overcome my own sort of deficits with, uh, 
writing and 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 now again with the show surrounding myself with people who are really good at it you know the, the, uh, one of the things that is that i honestly just love about the job is that i get to sit in a room of people who are very very smart and they get my movie references and they get story turns and we you know that's really um a, a great assistance you know when you surround yourself with other people who are very good at what they do i want to get into the team stuff in a, in a little bit but um uh, you're talking about having the pitch ready i imagine then and this is probably very important for television you know you have to th- think about the, the the show as a product from at diff- different levels perhaps right. I'm, I'm guessing here, right? Like, like there's dialogue and there's these hidden clues and cues and stuff. And then there's, how is this going to appeal to a certain audience and, and stuff? And, and there's right. a lot of writing and exploration. So for example, if I'm writing a book, like I've got to write a lot about like, all right, who's this for? Why do they want to read it? Um, why are they going to recommend it to their friends? And you're thinking about those things you have to explore those. Is that something yeah. that you do with your writing process? Uh, well, you said, you know, are you talking about with the pitch itself or with sort I mean, of just the process ha- day to day? I guess, uh, you know, you were talking about having a, a pitch and being ready for it. I would imagine then that involves a lot of doing writing that isn't the uh, screenplay itself. Yeah, I think there's always a lot of like different levels, different meta, um, like the meta writing kind of. Yeah, there's well, I think, yes, to, to me, the the. You know, if somebody, if a writer comes into the room and says, look, I've got this story and it's about X, it's, it's very hard. I'm not, I'm not good at sort of, okay, these are the thematics. It's a story about love. And so let, like, I can't, I read a quote. I, uh, I, and I still remember this. I either, I think I scribbled it down. I read a quote in a book that Hitchcock was talking about movies. He said, we develop a hearty plot and themes emerge as we go along. And I was like, oh, thank God. Okay. He has a plot. Somebody murdered somebody. They're burying a body. Later, you can go in and figure out that, oh, the body is about as a metaphor for his mother or whatever that, you know. So I, I just can't think. I'm not smart enough to think that way. So to me, it's the, the big moves of, all right, here's a beginning. Here's, here's four moves six moves, two moves that would be good in a story. And when we can identify those, whether it's in a pitch uh, for a network, which I've only really done once with the blacklist, but whether it's that or a story for the show or just a movie on my own that I'm doing, like I, I feel like I have to sort of identify those big couple moves and then you sort of keep slowly filling in the details, you know? And so again, the dialogue stuff, the locations, the cast and that stuff. I'm, I'm just like desperate to find something to hang on to that. It's like, okay, it's a movie about an architect. Uh, what people do I know that would be good to be like this guy, excuse me, this guy or this character? What, what other movies have I seen where there's somebody who has these qualities and trying to use that as like a placeholder in my head until I can find my own version of what it is. Does that, does that make sense? Or is that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's it's like if uh, I, I've been re- I was just reading a book about uh, Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel ceiling, and and uh, you know, people think of it as this this amazing heroic feat, but when you look at it, there's, there's things like you know the classical sculpture that there's certain mm. poses that he would kind of take and and integrate into the yeah. characters and and stuff, and and so that that might be something that you're doing in in developing a story. You're thinking about the movies that you've seen before, and yeah, you're borrowing characters a little bit like that. You go ahead and borrow it and then maybe that's the first pass and you go back over it and maybe now you're thinking about theme i think that's right i think you find little touchstones little signposts that uh you know that that are that get you excited or something that you want to you want to reference not reference rip off you know something that you you're like i want to do something like that you know and 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 find those little moments and then you know if it's if it's a thriller or if it's a spy show look if it's a if it's a heist movie i don't know how i don't think about oceans 11 so if we're going to do a heist episode it's like but what were some of the fun moves there, right? It's like, oh, there's a sequence of all the people coming together, you know, and so, and how they all have a different role. And so what would be a fun thing like that, that they could all do? And then you come up, you try to make it as different and unique as you can, but at least that's my process. Mm -hmm. You're making a, um, basically a movie a week, your fifth season starts 
pretty soon well, here. So you've made, yeah. there's been what, 94 episodes, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. We're breaking uh 90, uh, yeah. 97 or something like that now. Yeah. So the latest episode that you've finished, what was the process for, for that? Episode 96, um, I guess would be it, right? Yeah. Well, the one, the one we're writing right now, um, you know, we, we had, uh, you know, uh, the woman had the Carla had an idea. Uh, Carla Kettner had an idea for the episode, and um, actually, I had heard a story on NPR about uh, Alzheimer's and and about how people get, conf- you know, some of the some of the paranoia that sometimes comes with Alzheimer's. And so, I had said, guys, here's again, here's the here's the canvas, Alzheimer's. Is there a story in that where we have somebody that is confused and maybe they don't know they're confused? And she went away, Carla Kettner went away and came up with a, with a story that has nothing to do with Alzheimer's, but has to do with um, memory and false memories and, and sort of uh, almost in a memento. Again, I go to a touchstone, like memento is a, a story about memories and, and, and the mind and how it works. And so she came up with some big moves. The, a couple more of, of the writers that we work with a lot, uh, John Eisendrath and Luke Ryder and Rick Orsi, we all kind of got together with Carla and we sat and talked about it for a day or two. And then we start putting moves up on the board and you and try to stage, find... Wait, how much work has Carla done before you start having this conversation? Uh, um, probably more than she wants to, to have done. She's probably broken a version of it. You know, she's, she, in fact, I think she sat down and, and pitched breaking, us like... Breaking, can you... Uh, that, that's a yeah. new... Term. I've, I've heard that in some of your previous interviews, but uh, it's oh, new to uh, me because I'm not a screenwriter. Sure. Uh, well, she'll, she will... She has a whiteboard in her office and goes down and and, uh, you know, breaks out every scene, you know, and some, some of them are not full. Some are like act five might be like, well, there's a big chase where we go look for the bad guy, you know, and we know we'll figure that out, but you know, a beginning, a middle and end, some scenes that fill it in and she would pitch that and we go great like this. Don't like that. Let's keep talking about it. And inevitably, whether it's an idea I have or an idea somebody else has, it evolves into something entirely different. And we just keep chipping away at it for, a, you know, three days, probably four days before all of a sudden the pieces, you start, you start having enough of those, those highlighted all caps sentences that you go, ah, I think this would be a good act out in the middle. We have six struck, six, six, um, com- five commercial breaks in an episode of network television. So there's six acts and each act out needs to have some forward momentum, some turn, some story reveal. And so if you, if we can put up six moves that are the end of each act, right before you go to commercial, the six cliffhangers, you kind of go, ah, I'm starting to see it a little bit. And then you start to work, work, you know, we sit there and we work on it for, you know, another couple of days trying to fill in the pieces and figure out the characters and on the blacklist, figure out what the serialized story is, what's happening with, you know, in the personal lives of our, our characters. And, um, and it becomes a process where, you know, she goes off and does a script and, and turns it in. And I give notes on it and she does another draft. And, and then John Eisendrath and I take a pass at that script. And it's just an ongoing uh, process, even until we're shooting it. You know, production gets it and they say, well, you guys say it takes place in Morocco, but we shoot in New York. So there's not going to be a Morocco. So what else works? And we say, all right, well. Uh, Chechnya, are there brick alleys? And they, so we cha- we're rewriting there. We're constantly rewriting to try to get it down in time on budget, rewrite for actors. You know, you cast somebody who's, you know, a different ethnicity and all of a sudden they speak a different language. And so you're changing story points. And so, uh, and, and it's that way until we, we shoot really. And when it's, even sometimes when we're still shooting, we're rewriting. Even sometimes after it's, it's done, we're, oh, I got an email yesterday that said, Look, I need another line here. Liz walks up to a car and says something, but we need to hear what she would say in case we hear it in the background. So you kind of you're you're still even rewriting during the editing process, and finally, when they lock it, we're done. So um, that's a long winded version of what the process is. So Carla has like the six cliffhangers, and then you, you're talking about the those few days when you're you're working on it. You're just sitting in a writer's room talking aloud the entire time. Yeah. We just all sit around and try to, and- yeah, we have a writer's room assistant, uh, Katie Box, who sits here and, and sort of takes notes. And um, 
you know, every night at the end of the day, she sends out a PDF that's here's everything that came up, good and bad ideas. And um, we oftentimes go back and reference them. And and then cards start going up on a board, you know, where we start not car- literal cards, but, you know, sort of moves, story moves. And and um, uh, yeah, so it, it really is just a conversation. And sometimes it's just dead silence. I mean, I can't tell you it, it, every time it's terrifying, you know, uh, that there's not going to be an idea or an episode or you, there's that point uh, where you, what you go. What, what's what are you telling yourself when it's terrifying? To go on a walk and get a nice tea. Usually, uh, right, but what, like, uh, get me out of here. What is back to self talk? What what um, what are you saying to yourself that when you know when you're feeling terrified? To, uh, truthfully, sometimes I and I think everyone kind of does this. I, I I sometimes I'm ready to do this on our ninth episode that we've talked about for a couple of days. Everyone has a little bit of a different idea, and I I sometimes just feel like I need to go sit alone. You know, I I'll I'll truthfully tomorrow I'll probably sit at my computer and do what I did when I was writing movies alone and just write to myself for a minute and say, what is it that I like about this? Like, should we be doing this? And like, okay, if we are, what is cool about it? And why is this going to be unique and, 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 and worth it? And, and inevitably you come up with a couple moves that you go, that is cool. We're going to do that. That'll be a great moment. And you find a couple of those and you kind of get your mojo back. So, and, and, but every episode has that. Every, every story we tell, there's, there's that moment where, you know, somebody jokingly says, time of death, like, can we all go home yet? Or time for a four o'clock break. And, you know, and you just, it, it's hard. It's like the seven minute silence, you know, like the room you can kind of feel needs a breath or to take a break or go for a walk. And, and, you know, we call our wives or go read the internet or just ignore it for a few minutes and come back to it. I th- thought that was interesting that you talked about going and sitting by yourself and doing the writing to yourself. Cause the thing I was going to ask was about the change between doing that kind of solitary <laughs> writing, which is the way that I typically write. Uh, yeah. and, and sitting in a room, like talking aloud about stuff. I, I mean, that might, I might like that a little bit, but every day would be, would be tricky. But you know what? A big I, change for you. Uh, it, that it, they're talking about culture shock. That is a that was a culture shock, and it has been good for my marriage because I don't ask my wife about story nearly as much, if at all. That used to be a thing. Like, oh my god, are we really talking about this story again? And, or now there are actually people who are you know paid to do it and like doing it. But it is very different than writing a writing on your own. You know, which is all I've ever done until this show started and. I got to say, it's, it's, if, it, don't try it because it's very, it's very codependent. You know, you start, it's, I, I have a hard time thinking about going back and doing stuff on my own just because, you know, other people have great ideas. And, um, it, 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 uh, I, I don't miss the, uh, solitary part of it, you know, uh, oh, as you don't. know, it's, huh. I, I really don't. I mean, at, at times I do and I get, maybe I just get doses of it because like right now I took today and John Eisendrath who, and I, who run the show, John went off and took pieces of a script that he's going to rewrite. And I took pieces. I said, let me do these eight scenes. You do those eight scenes. And, um, and I just got to sit and write and it was great. And I, I get into it and I do my thing. So I have those moments, but then when I'm going back to the drawing board going, okay, what is this episode? There's other people to talk to. So I, I really, I really think it's, it's great. It's, um, I think it's a, it's, I think it's healthy in a way. Do you think it would have worked earlier on in your career when perhaps your voice as a writer was not as well defined? Um, no, probably I don't. I, I think one thing that I think is, is probably very difficult for any writer on this show and probably any show is that you're trying to match the, a, a, a voice, you know, of, of a character and of, in this case of, of what the show is, you know, and I think that would be, if, if I went on some, if I went on pick a thriller, you know, any other show and tried to do it, I don't know if I could do it. it it's, it's, um, this is why you didn't very, take the career route <laughs> or the, well, you yeah. know what? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I did not like many, like most TV writers, I never, before I had written this, I wrote one other pilot that didn't go and I've never written an episode of TV. So I don't really, 
I didn't come you up were doing movies that. before, such as Perfect well, yeah. Stranger with Halle Berry and um, and, yeah. and Bruce Willis. Yeah, yeah. That uh, there, there, are, there are a few movies that I had, I had either worked on or or that got made that. Uh, that was my experience, and I knew a movie structure, which is very different from a TV structure. Just like I'm sure a novel and short story have different structures, other than just being shorter than, than longer than each other. But, but I didn't sort of come up through that apprenticeship type thing that is in television, where you you, know, you start as a writer's room assistant, and then you become a staff writer, and you you slowly work your way up and get better at it and learn how to do it. And I just sort of. Uh, I had written a script and, and, uh, you know, it, so, so I didn't have the, the benefit of that. And, and yet I got a, got very, very luckily to be in a position where I got to say, all right, well, we don't want to do the story that way. We're going to do it this way. And I get a, I, I'm one of the guys who gets to help decide, you know? And, and so, um, so just day to day practice wise, it's, it's a very different experience. And to me, it was really refreshing to try to all of a sudden be in a room of people. And I was like, wow, this is, this is, I, I, it was just, it was very unique. I heard you on another interview talk about, you know, when you get stuck on a story that you go to mythology, um, I'd be interested to hear, like, when did you first learn about mythology and, and how do you use it in storytelling? There might be too many questions at once, but well, no, I, um, at least on this show, it's, there's sort of a combination of the case of the week, a story, the standalone episode, here's a bad guy naked in the woods. We're going to catch him by the end. And the serialized story, which is the mythology, which is the deeper big question of who is Raymond Reddington and why did he show up into this woman's life? And I think one of the things that is successful about our show is that it's not just Okay, here's the serial killer this week. Here's the bank robber this week. When when those stories start to feel a little tired, we flip over and and, and tell a personal story. And I we're now, certainly we not do, the, like yeah. with with say <clears throat> Reddington and why is Reddington in a Agent Keen's life? Is that a corollary to some sort of uh, you know what are like the mythological ar- archetypes of that? I mean, I, I, I'm I'm sort of grasping in the dark because I don't know a whole lot about using mythology and storytelling. So, well, when you say mythology, I mean I really just mean backstory. You know, oh, I, I just okay. mean like who is this? Uh, uh, you know, like I, I don't Joseph mean Campbell a, sort of. No, oh, I wish. Oh, oh my god. And the, you know, the, no. here's these different fairy tales that oh. came from or whatever. No, that feels very English. Uh, English 101. I'm. I don't know that stuff. I mean, I, look, I feel it. I can see. Okay, this. And I, you know, okay, this is a man versus himself, man versus nature. You know, I mean, I, I'm, yes, I'm sure we tell those kinds of stories. When I mean we we go to the mythology, I just mean that we go, we dip into the larger backstory of uh-huh. what's really going on. You know, in the X Files, is the truth really out there? You know, every third or fourth episode, they'd be like, you know, they'd have a monster show, a monster show, and then here's a story about these two people and who are they really and what's going on with them and so. That's that's what we do there is we kind of flip back and forth between those two. Now I wish I was I we were doing full on Joseph Campbell stuff. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, I'd have to read the book. Right? We're we're getting pretty close to time here. I want to uh I always like to ask my guests if they have any books uh that they would recommend. What was like like the last book that you read that changed the way you saw something? Well, I don't know if it was the last one, but I'll tell you two that I thought were uh, really important uh, for me, just as a writer, um, were uh, David Mamet has a book called, I believe it's called On Directing Film. Um, might be On Acting. He, there's two of them, but he has a book called On Acting that is really almost more about directing and storytelling and, you know, uh, the moves of stories and how to tell it in pictures. And so that David Mamet book was, uh, w- was really important for me and also, uh, Stephen King has a book. Um, I don't know what it's called, but it's a book. It's a, it's something like, maybe it's on writing, something like that. All these books are on writing. writing. Is that what it is on writing? I love that book. That's probably where he says inspiration is for amateurs. I'm pretty sure. Is that right? Yeah. I'm sure I have that underlined somewhere. I knew that sounded somewhere in there. Yeah. (laughs) But that, but that book again, it's like, it's a, it's a little, that's okay. There you go. That's a book where it's a little like, all right, here's a chapter and most of it's about sort of writing. And then 
let's go back into the mythology and tell the story about how he overcame alcoholism, you know? And, oh. and it's a little bit about, here's the story about how he got, he was hit by a van and, and overcame that. And now let's go back to the A story where we're talking about writing and what it is and how the story, ha- that, that book I thought was just great. I've read that a couple of times. So, so both of those, just in terms of writing and seeing how other people who I respect do it, I thought those were great. And we've talked about a lot of different things here, uh, you know, um, the writing process. We've talked about, uh, well, what else have we talked about? Getting out of Nebraska. Um, well, getting and, back in and Nebraska. you're still in Nebraska. Yeah. We didn't get a chance to talk yeah. too much about getting back into Nebraska. I know that you right. restored a theater there, which is really interesting. And, um, yeah. Do you have a final message uh, for listeners that would kind of wrap up uh, our conversation? I guess we could probably narrow it down to about uh, writing and making it as a pro. Uh, Well, um, I would preface it by saying I don't really, nobody should be listening. I I don't really know. But, um, you know, from my experience, I'm, again, fairly idealistic about things. And I feel like, um, you just can't quit, you know, you, you, you really can't stop. And I, uh, you know, here's an anecdote, right. I, that, that maybe would be a better way to dramatize that. I, um, had worked in LA for, I don't know, 15, 20 years writing movies and going from job to job and trying to trying to kind of stay above the fray. And, and, and at first it was very, it was very easy cause it was, um, independent films were happening and the calls were all incoming and jobs were abundant. And slowly over time, uh, you know, there's, um, they, they dry up the 2008 came the recession and, and, uh, the housing bubble and all this stuff. And, you know, the jobs became very scarce. And before, just before that happened, my wife and I had decided to move back to Nebraska, that that's where we wanted to raise our kids. And that's what we wanted to do. And I felt like, well, you know what, I'm going to stop trying to take assignments and look for the next job. And I'm just going to write stuff I love, right? I'm going to write something I really want to do. And I wrote two scripts that didn't work. Um, and I wrote, uh, something that became, uh, that became the blacklist. Right. And, and so that, when that happened, I had to move away from my family. I had to go come back to LA. I had, it was incredibly stressful. I'd never done it before. I knew how super lucky I was, but I, um, I felt in moments of great panic, whether it was not being able to come up with a story or thinking I didn't know how to do this, I felt like, you know what? I, um, if this doesn't work, I need to go home. I get to go back to my family. I get to go back to just writing my movies. Maybe people will make them, maybe not. But I get to go home. And I felt like there was a great sort of freedom in feeling like, and in recognizing that what was working was me being me and not trying to duplicate some other voice, not trying to chase a job, not trying to like get the next paycheck, which I've spent plenty of time doing, but just like saying, you know what, fuck everyone else. I'm going to write this thing that I think is really cool. And whether it took three years for the first one that I ever wrote or, or the stories that we tell now, I, 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 I really felt unencumbered and I felt um, empowered really for the first time as a writer. And, and so I would never have gotten to that place or had that experience if I had quit, you know? And so I'm a big uh, believer and it sounds super sappy, but I just, you can't stop. That's uh, whether you're sitting there and want to go on a nice tea break and, uh, you know, call the time of death on the day, or uh, you've been writing the script for three years, you just can't stop because you never know uh, when it'll click, when somebody will say yes, when the stars will align. And I think the, the show and, and the success that I've had recently has been a great example of that, that, um, you know, you just got to keep writing. I think you've, you've really kind of boiled down this, this entire show really. And I'd like to add to that, that uh, I think this yeah. is kind of part of what you were saying is, is that you decided to make something that was uniquely yours. And in a way that, uh, seems like it motivated and you propelled you to be able to not quit. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that the one thing that, uh, it took me a long time to realize. And, um, I think it's true is, you know, if you're, if you're an actor, you look a certain, this is about writing specifically, but if you're an actor and you want the part of the 
uh, you know, that you're not built for, then that's hard. If you're a producer and you can't get the movie, then that's, uh, you, you can't get your hands on that property. Or, you know, there's, there's enough, you're an editor who wants a job, but the other guy got the job. If you're a writer, the thing that is unique about writing and the thing that I love about it is that no matter who you are, you really are the only person with that voice. And that is the thing to, you know, really lean into, whether it's weird or whatever it is, just, but, but, and, and it took me a long time, it took me 20 years to figure that out. Like, you know what? I'm going to do my thing. That's the one thing nobody else can, can do. And that's the only thing that people in Hollywood want is originality. Well, maybe that's not exactly true, but, uh, but, but it, but it feels that way. I think that's really at the end of the day, what, what moviegoers and people watching TV want is something that's original and different. And those are the things that, that pop through and are ultimately remembered. And I think it's, it's hard to rem- remind yourself of that when you're in the muck. But at the end of the day, your voice is the only one you got. And that's the thing that's special about it. And I sound like a self-help coach now, but, but I try to remind myself of that. I think that's really important. Oh God, you just, you just nailed it so, so much for me. Um, I think you're going to have a lot of new fans Sweet. and they, they of course need to, Oh, fantastic. they of course need to, uh, watch the blacklist on NBC and it's on Netflix as well. Um, where can they get more of yeah. you? Uh, probably through that show that at the moment seems like that's all of me. It's all, it's a yeah. little all consuming, but that's, but look, that's it. There's a, uh, I, uh, yeah, the blacklist, uh, season four actually came out today and we start our new season on, uh, on Netflix. It came out today and we start our new season on the 27th and it, it really is, is season five, a, right? A, the 27th? Season five. And it's wow. a really fun season. It's really it's really a gas, and I think people, uh, even if, even dipping into the show new, I think people would have a lot of fun. Wonderful. Uh, John, I can't thank you enough. This has been amazing. Thanks. Hey, I'm, I'm flattered that you asked. It, it's super cool to, to speak with you again. After 10 years. <laughs> If you enjoyed that conversation with John Bokenkamp, check out The Blacklist on NBC or on Netflix. John and I talked about the mindset that it took to decide that writing was his job before he was even getting paid for it. Now, listen to Jeff Goins on episode 27. He had to believe he was a writer before he could become a writer. We just need to listen. So these were voices in my life saying, this is who you are. Are you going to be this? Or are you going to keep trying to be somebody else? And so I was like, well, I guess I'll give this a, a try. Like maybe activity follows identity. Maybe I have to start thinking like this person and then I'll, and I'll act like it and then I'll become that person. Again, Jeff is on episode 27. I personally loved hearing about John's process of writing page after page of stream of consciousness and going back and organizing it. If you liked that too, you might also like David Allen on episode 85. David shares a lot of detail on how he managed to write his hit book, Getting Things Done. But again, that's the magnificence of, of the digital, you know, word processors. It's like they let you have ideas later on to figure out where they go. So be sitting down and just giving myself the freedom to just write an idea out and then, you know, do double, you know, click, 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 you know, and then another idea, write it out, click, 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 click. Editing is really the art of writing. You know, uh, you know, so you write the crappy first draft and then come back and then look at what you've done and then see what shows up there from a higher altitude. Again, David is on episode 85. I work hard to help you crack the code on fulfilling work. If Love Your Work is helping you, there are some ways you can help support the show and make it even better. One is to subscribe, 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 subscribe. This is especially effective on Apple Podcasts or iTunes because it boosts rankings and helps others find the show. I know many of you listen on Overcast because you're the early adopter types. So even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please subscribe there anyway. Subscribe in your iPhone, your iPad, your Apple TV, your computer. The more devices, the better. It really helps. Apple Podcast ratings help too. Just go to cadavy.net slash Apple, click on write a review, and click on the star rating. You don't even have to write a review. It just takes a couple seconds. You can also join Love Your Work Elite. You'll get access to episodes before everyone else. You could even get ad-free interviews weeks in advance, and you can get your name or business mentioned in the credits of the show. For details, go to lywelite.com. That's lywelite.com. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by top Love Your Work elite members such as Arif Akhtar. This has been Love Your Work. 
and I'm David Cadvey. The theme music for the show is More Streets, performed by Spider Flower. Love Your Work is a production of Cadvey, Inc. <laughs>